In this video, we're going to cover these learning objectives. We're going to talk a little bit about acid-base indicators and their purpose, and then we're also going to look at determining the proticity of an acid. The first point links into this science understanding. Acid-base indicators are weak acids or bases, where the acidic form is of a different color from the basic form. Acid-base indicators can be used essentially, um, as their name suggests, as indicators. They can be used to determine whether solutions are often acidic, basic, um, sometimes we use the word alkaline, or neutral. And the way they are used uh, is in the fact that they undergo particular colour changes depending on the pH. We'll be talking about pH uh, in a later video, but pH is essentially a relative measure of the acidity or the basicity of a solution. This image shows you a range of different indicators and the colours that they can form based upon the different pH of a particular solution it's placed in. So as an example, we've got here bromophenol blue, where it can undergo a colour change from yellow to blue. The intermediate colour is like a mixture between yellow and blue, so it forms a green colour. And it's this particular colour within this particular pH range here. So if your solution had a pH less than 3, bromophenol blue will uh, give you a yellow colour. Between about 3 to 4.5, it will be this green colour. And 4.5 and, and above, we've got a colour of blue. Litmus is another example, and it's one of the most common indicators that we use. So in this case for litmus, we can see that the colour changes in at different pHs. So at about five and a half and below, litmus gives you this deep red colour. Between five and a half to about eight, it is this sort of intermediate between red and blue, which is purple. And then anything that's about eight or above gives you a quite deep blue colour. We do have other types of indicators, and so each of those indicators can give you characteristic colour changes. This is another image just showing you that there are other types of indicators available, and it also provides you information about the so-called pH ranges where the colour is actually undergoing a change. The science understanding stated that acid um, base indicators are typically weak acids or bases themselves. I've got here uh, the structural formula of phenylthalene, which is uh, a common indicator that's used. In acidic solutions, phenylthalene has this particular structure here. And this particular compound uh, is colourless. However, in a basic solution, phenylthalene changes its structure. What we see is that this group here has actually changed. What you've done is you've effectively lost a proton so in the presence of a basic solution, uh, phenylthalene loses a proton, it becomes negatively charged, and this structure now interacts with visible light and it reflects light in the uh, red to pink uh, region of, of uh, visible light. This image just further reinforces that, so we have what we can call the acid and the basic form of phenylthalene. So in an acidic solution, we have this colourless complex structure here, whereas as we increase the pH, uh, going to a more basic solution, phenylthalene structure changes to this form here, which now gives off a pink colour. This image here shows you that if we were to increase the pH of a solution, perhaps by adding a base, we can see these colour changes occur going from the colourless in an acidic solution, eventually going to this light pink and eventually to this quite deep pink or deep magenta colour. Universal indicator is a, a common indicator that we use. It's made up of five different indicators that can give a range of colours and these colours can be used to determine the pH of a solution. If we look at the lower end of the pH scale, we have the reds, oranges, yellows. Going to the neutral, we've, we're starting to get the green colours. And as you further increase, you can get to the blues and then to the purples. And we can see the same thing just down here. You've got quite a range of colours that can be produced 
at particular pHs. The second science understanding for this video is looking at acids and classifying them as monoprotic or polyprotic, depending on the number of protons available for donation. You'll need to know, given the structural formula of an acid, how to classify it as monoprotic, diprotic, or triprotic. Bit of background, acids we say contain hydrogens that can be donated to bases. We can divide up acids as either inorganic or organic. So inorganic acids will be things like hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, carbonic acid, and phosphoric acid. And what we notice is that each of these formulae have hydrogen at the front of their chemical formula. Organic acids, on the other hand, so things like acetic or ethanoic acid, their structure can look a bit different because we've got this functional group here. This is what we call a carboxyl functional group. And it's this hydrogen in this COOH group that can be donated to bases. It's important to note that these hydrogens, which are effectively bonded to this carbon, are not able to be donated to bases. So that's why I've shown you the donatable hydrogens in bold. In order to become donated, hydrogens need to be covalently bonded to an atom with quite a high electronegativity. That means that the atom it's bonded to has a, a strong attraction for the electrons that have been shared with hydrogen, which means that the hydrogen can potentially lose its electron and then form a H plus or a proton. Acids can differ in the number of protons that can be donated. So firstly, monoprotic acids are acids that can only donate one proton, which makes sense because mono means one. Hydrochloric acid and acetic or ethanoic acid are examples of monoprotic acids. We can see in red here, these are the hydrogens that are capable of being donated. And that's because they are bonded to quite electronegative atoms. Chlorine being a quite electronegative atom, oxygen also being the same. So if we have a look at the um, bonding, we would note that chlorine has a partially negative charge, hydrogen with a partial positive charge, and in acetic acid, we've got oxygen with a partial negative, and the hydrogen with the partial positive. This now makes sense that the hydrogen may potentially lose its uh, valence electron to the oxygen or to the chlorine to then be lost as a proton. These hydrogens on the other hand are bonded to carbon and we know that hydrogen to carbon bonds are relatively non-polar. So we're not going to get this loss of electrons um, in this case, to form H+. Polyprotic acids refer to any acids that can donate more than one proton. The first type is what we would call diprotic, so the prefix di refers to two, so the diprotic acids can donate two protons. We've got the structural formula of sulfuric acid and carbonic acid here, and again you can see these hydrogens are bonded to rather electronegative atoms, that then means that they can eventually be lost as protons and therefore be donated. Carbonic acid, we've got these oxygens here and here with hydrogens that again can be donated and in both cases we've got two protons that can be donated. If we take sulfuric acid as one example, we know it's a diprotic acid. What we say is that sulfuric acid can ionize in two stages. So. The first stage involves sulfuric acid donating one proton to water. It forms this particular compound, which is called the hydrogen sulfate ion, and it also forms hydronium ions. We can see that this hydrogen sulfate ion has another hydrogen that can essentially be donated. However, because it is negatively charged, it's not going to do this as readily as H2SO4. So we've shown that this is more a reversible process. The HSO4 minus ion can still effectively donate protons to water, and in doing so, it forms a sulfate ion and another hydronium ion. We can sometimes represent this as a single equation. So we have our net or overall equation where we sum everything on both sides, 
cancel out anything that's common and hopefully you can see that the hydrogen sulfate ion is an intermediate compound that uh, should be cancelled out overall so that we're left with H2SO4 plus two lots of water go to produce one sulfate ion and two hydronium ions. So we can see that sulfuric acid as a diprotic acid can produce potentially twice as many hydronium ions as a monoprotic acid. Triprotic acids, as you guessed it, can donate three protons, tri referring to three. Below we have two different triprotic acids. Uh, this one here, which should be called phosphoric acid, has this formula H3PO4. We can see that phosphoric acid has three donatable protons, uh, all bonding to electronegative atoms. And the uh, second one is boric acid, H3BO3, which again has three donatable protons, all bonded to electronegative oxygens. Taking phosphoric acid as one of our triprotic acids, we could say that phosphoric acid can ionize in three stages. So the first stage being one donation of a proton, uh, H3PO4, reacting with water to produce uh, H2PO4 minus. This is called the dihydrogen phosphate ion plus hydronium. We can get a second stage, but it's not going to be as readily occurring as the first one. So the dihydrogen phosphate ion reacting with uh, water to produce the hydrogen phosphate ion has a two negative charge and hydronium ions again and finally because there's one more proton that can be donated this can then eventually form the phosphate ion plus a hydronium ion so if we sum these three reactions together what we should end up with is a net or overall equation of H3PO4 reacting with three waters to produce a phosphate ion and three hydronium ions. That concludes 5.1 on acid-base concepts. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.